Hi, welcome to Real Magic Review. My name is Steve Faulkner and this is my interview with John Graham. John Graham has written a book and John Graham has written a very, very good book. I will be doing a full review when I've finished it. There's about a quarter left, um, but it's just great. And you'll find out why if you listen to this interview. This interview is going to be brilliant for you wherever you are on your magic journey, whether you're a complete beginner, full of gold or completely advanced. Importantly, if you're thinking of taking stuff onto stage, close up magic onto stage or pile up. But even if you're not, you'll, you'll gain an awful lot from this interview. It was a joy. John was a joy, not only because he was lovely and he really knows his stuff. I mean, he really knows his stuff. He's been doing this for a very long time and he's given away his entire act here and all his theory. It's just, it's encyclopedic, this thing. Uh, but also because we, as you'll see at the beginning, um, a few weeks ago we recorded an interview and it didn't record and we spoke for over an hour and it was just horrible. It broke my heart because it was such a lovely interview. And I said, we're not going to be able to recreate that. But I said, well, let's wait three weeks you know for, and, and do it again so it feels fresh and it certainly did feel fresh we didn't talk about any of the same stuff it was a fresh conversation and i thought it was a better one because we were both in a different place uh, well i was in a different place he was brilliant on the first one um but he, he you know he's got three weeks of this book being out now he's got a feel for how it's done so that's what i mean uh, by that anyway i'll stop rambling which is very hard for me to do uh, you might recognize uh, if you know the channel Listen to the interview. Before we do that, please like and subscribe. Do all that usual stuff if you like it, of course. Um, share it. That'll be great because I think this is shareable for magicians. Uh, mention it on the forums. That'd be lovely. And um, we'll check out cardmagiccourse.com. It might not be called that uh, anymore because we're doing so much more than cards. We might be changing the name. So or the links will work below. So use all the links below to the book, John's book, and also the course. That'll be great. But anyway, let's go on with it. Here's my interview with John Graham. says it's recording all right great so <laughs> so look how shiny i am this isn't just nerves so for those of you and it nice. says it's recording for those of uh people watching um i'll just explain what happened we did a recording well did we do a recording we did an interview about an hour and 20 minutes or whatever um, <laughs> before christmas i was very excited i hadn't done an interview for a while i was very nervous and then zoom at the end usually does this thing of going recording converting and it didn't and we both saw it as recording. You said you'd seen it as recording and it just disappeared. Now, the terror now, obviously, John, but the amazing thing is you're here and you haven't just gone, no, uh, I'm not going back there because I've wasted an hour and 20 minutes of my time whilst, yeah, after just no. spending all that time. Yeah. Honestly, um, it was great talking to you. It, it's not like <laughs> it was work or anything. We had a conversation and it was enjoyable. So it would be yeah. like if we were on the phone talking. I mean, it was great. Yeah, and hopefully it records this time. Yeah, cool. So it's recording now. We'll know at the end. If not, you can um, slander me over the internet of being the most unprofessional person. You can get, get on the cafe and give me a, a going over. <laughs> I, uh, I, um, so that was good. But what, what's interesting is that at the time, I, I lost sleep. I, I was up all night. I was really, it mm. did my head in. And then you forget that I was like, well, we can't record that again because it was so fresh. And now a month's passed or whatever. And um, not month, but maybe three weeks. And it does feel, you know, uh, being the age of 48, I can't remember half of the stuff we said anyway. So, <laughs> Well, I promise not to answer every question by saying, well, we went over that already. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah I, can't remember. I can't remember what I did yesterday. It's been Christmas. It's been, it's been a know. very... Um, no, I'm glad to talk to you. And I appreciate Thanks. you even being interested to talk to me and about the book. It's um, It's an honor. So it wasn't... A, uh, it wasn't an ordeal for me, and you shouldn't let it stress you out either. Good man, thank you, thank you. Of course. And how? So you? So that was? So the book came out. What did the book come out a month ago? About? I would say about a month ago, maybe just uh, just under a month. Maybe it's hard to say because the days all sort of start blending in. Um, but yeah, I think about uh, three weeks before Christmas or so. So it probably was yeah. about a month ago. Yeah, so so a lot. That's quite good. And there it is, uh, stage by stage. A lot of you would have uh, heard of it by now. Would obviously go into the the book because it's a it's a special thing indeed. Um, but you now have a kind of handle on how it's gone, right? So where we when we spoke, it only just come out. Obviously, the 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 initial interest was there, and everybody was sort of positive about it. But how's it been going now? Yeah, it's been going great. I've been getting uh, messages from a lot of magicians 
who are really responding to the book and saying some of the things that I hoped people would say and connecting with it in a way that I hoped that people would. And uh, Josh and Andy at Vanishing Inc. are saying they think this book is going to be evergreen, that it's just going to be this book that's always going to be desired by people when, once they get to that level where they want to do a stage show. So yeah, the response has been great. I've been, um, like I said, the messages, a lot of uh, encouraging uh, posts and things like that. So really, really great. And what, when you say that, that you, people have been sort of getting what you thought they would get out of book or saying the things you kind of wanted them to say, what kind of things? And I suppose, yeah. I suppose you could tie that into what, what the main kind of thesis of the book is. Yeah, people who recognize that these are my working routines and that it really is solid information that I'm giving. And I've had people say I've already added several of the tricks to my repertoire. Uh, Name Dropper, the, uh, my take on Paul Harris's Deep Astonishment is getting a lot of response. People saying I already made that up. I'm already practicing it. I'm going to use it. And it's kind of, you know, it's nice. But that is one trick I would have loved to have kept, kept to myself, to be honest. Um, yeah. Uh, there you go. No, sorry, sorry, I interrupted then. Um, because okay. I do that. I'm a terrible interviewer. Uh, this is gonna happen. <laughs> I, it's okay. <laughs> I haven't I haven't talked to anybody but my kids for about three weeks, John. <laughs> you, you have to part with it. I've got so much to say. I don't know what it is. But, um, <laughs> honestly, I love them, but that school can't open early enough. Um, I'm happy to hear. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that on that, you're because it is. And, and I've talked about this before, but some people say this is out of my re working repertoire. You know, you get so many releases now saying it's straight and you look at it and you go, is it? You know, yeah. and, and I have mentioned that before. This is clearly your, because you go, you go through the sort of iterations, is that the word, of, of each trick as well? So you go, how you got to that point? So when you talk about the newspaper tale, you talk about you went from the Gene Anderson one and then, so you've been through this process, you've put all those hours in, you've put all that work in, you've got to a point where you're going, this is the, this is the one for me now. And is there part, I mean, what is that feeling like when you put it out there? When, when, you, when you put it out there and go, I'm giving it, giving it to everybody yeah. else. Because word it's for word as well, question. some of it, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, 20 years ago, I would not have even have told another magician what tricks I do in my show, even if I didn't change them at all. And if I was doing it just as the original creator taught it and released it, I was always keeping stuff to myself because I didn't want other people to do them. Or the thing like the uh, Norman Ashworth dry erase board where you erase it, the board says the name of the card is. And mm -hmm. then as you erase it, it says 10 of hearts. Mm -hmm. That's an old trick that's been out there for decades. But I didn't want to let, want to let another magician know that I was doing that because I wanted to keep it to myself. So I guess once you come to peace with it and you say, I'm gonna put it all out there and it, it is my working routines because this is a book that teaches my whole act. So I'm not you know, faking anything along the way. And everybody who's at Magi Fest saw my complete show too. So they know what I teach in the book is what I actually do. So um, I guess it's good because you know, I, you know, you don't have that sense of holding onto something anymore it's just out there and if people see it and they respond to it i'm sure you've had a magician comment on a trick of yours say oh i really like that thing you did with the whatever and you you kind of accept the compliment but you're also thinking no oh, thank you but please don't do it you know we yeah, all yeah. have that you know so i i feel i'm fine with it to be honest i've come to terms with it and if it helps people great and what we find is that I mean, I don't think there's anyone out there who's going to say, I want to do his complete act just the way he does. I don't think people want to do that. I think they want to find their own voice and use the experience of others to kind of give them a jump start in the direction that they want yeah. to go in. Yeah, and I think there's something in that. And I think that there will be people that will, uh, and I think you kind of allude to this, and, and I know Darren Brown's talked about it. He talked about it, international magic, and I talk about this idea of... Um, the, the idea of when you learn or where you're learning, you you copy and then you you perfect it and then you you get creative. And and this idea of copying at the beginning when you're not experienced, just to get a feel of of what something feels like with the idea of adapting. And I think that's the important thing. People are very sniffy about people copying routines, you know, especially the routine you get when you buy a trick. And I, I do it, you know, because I'm not comfortable yeah. with the trick. I want to get a feel physically for the trick. I want mm -hmm. to know what it feels like when I say the things and then go, all right, now, now I can adapt it. And I think that that, 
that the free sees all it copy conf, gain confidence and then and then create and, and i think that yeah. if you bypass that confidence thing we can get really stuck and i think that what you do here with you i mean you say again and again in it you know these are my word for it this is exactly what i do I, you know not exactly quoting but there's a feeling that you're going to adapt it um and you have tricks from you know harry lorraine harry lorraine close-up card tricks that you've, you've you've put on stage uh, right up to more i suppose more what we see is more classic kind of um stand-up tricks have you had any i just wondered if and I, I wouldn't wouldn't expect so but you know i've read the magic cafe have you had any kind of kickback on people saying oh you can't do these close-up tricks on stage because i hear that a lot from people who have never tried and i wondered if there's been any of that i didn't have people saying you can't do it i've had people saying i'm surprised that you can do it and i never th thought to do it um yeah. the ring routine which is basically a version of ring flight and a ring on string routine and then culminates with the ring inside of a of an envelope a lot of people have done routines like that but a lot of people are telling me i never thought about doing that on stage and for me, it, it came about from necessity of, you know, wanting to work on stage, but not having the material and saying, I'm going to take some material from my close-up repertoire and do it on stage just so that I can get through the time and do the time that I need to do on stage. But I find that it works and there are other benefits that I wasn't expecting, such as doing a close-up trick on stage has the effect of drawing people in and making people pay a little bit uh, closer attention to what you're doing. And I wouldn't do a whole show. I mean, I wouldn't say do a whole close-up show on stage because eventually people will tune out and say, I can't see it. I don't know what he's doing. I'm not interested. But you do one trick like that towards the beginning of your show and then move into something more visual. It really has that effect of drawing people in. So yeah, I didn't have anybody say, you can't do this on stage. Um, thankfully, maybe people are more open-minded and maybe people have done it. You know, and yeah. people know the close up tricks that they do that can be seen by a bigger audience because we always run into situations where, you know, you might be doing walk around magic in a restaurant and then 40 people come in with a bridal party and you want to kind of entertain them and they're at one big table. So, what can you do for that whole table to be able to see you? You're not going to do um, an actual stage trick, you're not going to do a torn and restored newspaper. But you might do the ring routine where everything is held up at chest height that everybody can see. And so since you know it works, do it for more than 40 people. Do it for 80 people or 180 people or 280 people. Yeah. The, the, and I suppose my question came from the fact that before this book or anything, I, you know, I, I get a bit, <laughs> as a lot of people, and don't get me wrong, I think the forums are great and they've got some great stuff in them. But I do get a bit disheartened sometimes when I see people saying, you can't do this, you've got to do this. And, and sometimes that's from people that maybe haven't had the experience because as, yeah. and that's why I've, I, I'm glad this, this is kind of the proof really, because we know you've done it. We know you've taken these tricks out. We know they clearly work because you've worked them in. You don't, you don't do a trick for how many years, develop it. If it, you know, straight away, don't you, if a trick's not working, I've done it. I've taken yeah. tricks out and gone, actually it's too, it's too down here and it doesn't, there's mm -hmm. no way of adapting it. And I think that it kind of, this book takes that and, and, it kind of quietens the naysayers and I'm not saying there's thousands of them, but it also gives as a, as a chance to, to work with what we've got. And you've got this whole idea about, you know, where, when, when you kind of come up with your routines, rather than just to keep searching for more and more, you know, you work about looking at, you, you mentioned Tarbell a lot and people like that, and looking back at, at what you can adapt as you have with, you know, your um, respect for Harry Lorraine and, and Chris Kenner and people like that. So just tell me a little bit about that kind of process of, of when you go from, okay, I've got, an, I've got a new routine. I, I need to find another 10 minutes for my show. What, where mm. do you go for that? Where, what does that look like for you? Uh, well, for me personally, it can be kind of tough because I have a couple of shows that I do that I really am at the point where this is the show. I'm not looking to put anything into it. And if I want to try a new trick out, the show is so structured that it becomes hard to just put a new trick in sure. because you feel like you're throwing off the timing. So when I really start thinking about new material, I almost immediately start thinking of new material in the context of now a whole new show. And that's also hard because you want your shows to be different and you might do one magic show, 
So what do you do for your next show that you want to be different? And that's why you might be drawn to mentalism. Mm -hmm. So you're always trying to find a theme or a hook or something that makes your shows different. So, but when I'm putting something into the show, I feel like you have to do a new trick at least a hundred times before you even know if it's going to be good and if it's going to be worth doing. And I mean, doing it a hundred times in front of an audience and still doubting yourself at that hundredth time, I don't know if this trick is going to work out or not. And you've been doing it for a year now and you're still tweaking it and trying to find ways to make it better. And eventually you might just drop it. And then eventually you might go back to it and say, no, that works. There's something there that I want to use. You know, I had one show that I put together and I said, I'm going to do the show for one year, just at all the places where I work on a regular basis so that everybody who comes there would be able to say, wow, his show is brand new. I saw this show, I saw that show, but this show was all new. So I'm, I said, I'm going to do it for one year. And I did, and then I stopped doing it. And I was happy with some of the material and some of the material I wasn't happy about. But then I looked back and I said, I was doing great tricks in that other show. I shouldn't abandon them completely. So I started bringing them back and incorporating them into another show. So basically taking almost two hours of material and condensing it into one hour of material or 55 minutes maybe of material. So I think there are different approaches to, uh, you know, getting it on stage. And also one of the things that I love to do is to practice a trick in front of people um, close up and then doing it on stage. And that's what I did with um, Daryl's rope routine, a routine yeah. that I love that I've added nothing to, but I love doing the routine. Now that trick is too big to do at a table. I mean, the longest piece of rope is about five feet long. But if you're doing a lot of walk around magic, why not use that opportunity to try the trick out? And if you can be deceptive with it, if people do not know what you're doing close up, you're probably going to be OK doing it on stage. But you can watch people's eyes when you're doing it close up and you see what they're thinking and what they might be suspicious of and how they're reacting to it. And you get your timing down and people might say something and give you good lines. Now you take a trick that you've never done on stage and you can do it on stage with confidence and competence. People can tell, okay, this guy knows what he's doing, even though it's a trick you've never done on stage, but you have done it. So I guess there are lots of ways to go from close up to stage. Yeah. I'm, I'm, and I'm always, and that's and just, while, I'm, while we're at it, I'll just let people know that's kind of the main, like this, this idea of taking close up to stage, as you've said, um, in a way, in a way that isn't so obvious a lot of the time, I'm interested in, I know there's a lot of ways of looking at it, but I'm always interested in the way people do, uh, what those different ways are. And, and I, because people have got different approaches and I think it can be easy to kind of listen to one approach and say, that's the approach. And especially if, if you've read um, the classics, you know, Strong Magic, people like that, they're full of different approaches. And I think people can accidentally, not accidentally, but also almost subconsciously say, oh, that's the way to do it because someone I really respect has said that. And I think that's a really good yeah. thing of going, actually, this is one way. Um, yeah yeah but it but it may just be a, a spark of inspiration from from somewhere else and and with you know had i not read your your name dropper trick i got sent that to review quite a long time ago the um the paul harris um true true astonishment is that no that's the deep astonishment deep astonishment true astonishment yeah. is, a, is, is the dvd so now um yeah, yeah and and i got i lo don't wrong i i like i love the the trick and the premise and just just talk us through briefly what the the, the trick is because you'll I'll massacre it <laughs> that's okay <laughs> i love the trick too and it started with the anything deck in um <laughs> another uh the art of astonishment yeah yeah Everything one of the astonishment. Astonishment. There's, there's, there's some more coming out in there it's going to get very confusing for people like me <laughs> <laughs> and there's actually they're working on a new two book set right now yeah yeah right me which is going to also have the word astonishment, astonishment in the title. Yeah. Um, but it started with the anything deck, which was, you know, you put a set of cards under the card case. Somebody picks a card, you divine their card. You ask them for a magic word. They say a word like salt, you know, which yeah. didn't mean anything. And then you reveal their card and you spread out the cards under the card case. And there are letters written on the back of each one. And it says salt. So then with Deep Astonishment, which Paul Harris worked on with Rodney Whitlock, 
um, there were a lot of improvements made, you know, and the big improvement was that the cards under the card case were a different color from the deck of cards that you were using. But there were a lot of things that I did not like in the marketed version of Deep Astonishment, such as the magnets, the gimmicked wallet. There was a cue card that you used that you tried to secretly consult during the routine. Mm. And there were extra cards in the prediction packet at the end, just extra cards that didn't mean anything. So I really wanted to get rid of all those things and streamline it, not to try to be creative, but to try to come up with something that I could use for my own sake. And I really worked on it a lot, probably more than any other trick. And at one point I thought it was completely finished and I showed it to Paul Harris and I was doing a palm. And Paul said, why are you palming those cards? And I explained to him everything that the palm did. I said, it enables me to finish clean. I got rid of all the extra cards. And he said, yes, but why are you palming those cards? And I said, well, the prediction packet is cleaner at the end. And then this will help me with the reset. And he said, yes, but why are you palming those cards? I said, okay, Paul doesn't like palming. We change the subject and talk about something else. But in the back of my mind, I kind of knew that Paul was right. There's something better than palming the cards. And then one day, I remember the day when it hit me, a way that I could eliminate the palm. And before I could even go into the other room to grab a deck of cards and see if it would work, I knew it was going to work. And that's the way I've been doing it ever since. So the effect is, as I said, somebody cuts to a card. And now the other improvement that they made with Deep Astonishment, by the way, is instead of asking for a magic word, you ask for the name of a person, mm. somebody that means the world to them. And that alone makes the effect better. So now instead of spreading out the cards and it says the word salt, you spread the cards out and it's the name of their special person and it says Lily. That has an impact on people. Yeah. Same method, no extra work is involved, but seeing a loved one's name is definitely more powerful. And... Um, and when they see the name, that's, it's just the best trick you can do for people. I mean, it's the strongest trick that I do. And then I collect the cards, put them back into the wallet from where they came. And the whole trick is reset. I'm ready to do it again with a different card for them to cut to. Yeah. And of course, with a different name as well. And I love the fact that it's so compact. Like it's in my case right now. I could grab it right now and do it. I don't have to put something into my left pocket, something into my right pocket. These cards go here. This has to go on top right before I start. There's nothing like that. You take out the deck, you take out your prediction cards and you do it. And as soon as you're done, you don't reset it instantly. You just put everything away. And in the act of putting everything away, you're set to do it again. So, and I can be this enthusiastic about it because it's only my handling. This is Paul's trick. So I might be very enthusiastic, but I give Paul all the credit for it. And I think that comes through in the book as well, is, is that idea of, you know, you've taken the, those old, you know, it's an old school book in a way, you're taking the, the tricks that aren't, you're not trying to, like you said, for the sake of creativity, go, right, here's a new thing, here's a new way of doing it. And all those little things that, that you've talked about there are interesting for me because you've taken a trick, like I said, I, I, I saw that trick, deep astonishment or something. <laughs> <laughs> one of the, that one with a, and I got it and I went right it's it's arguably ridiculously magical because a random word is so random isn't it but what yeah. you've done is you've you, I suppose you could in theory and only in theory argue that it's less magical because there are more random words than there are names right mm, of course it, of course this is yeah but it isn't it's nonsense because it's kind of like saying I, I remember the Gustav Kuhn in the um, in his science of magic book, I can't remember the name of it, but um, experiencing the impossible it talks about why would it be more magical making something float that was really heavy than something that mm -hmm. was a little bit lighter because you're making stuff float. That's the trick. But it's it's <laughs> but right. it's that weird. Do you know what I mean? But it's yeah. that weird way we think. But actually, just by changing the script, really, and and making it a name, that's what was missing in the trick for me. And I'm not saying it's a bad trick. I think anything. Paul Harris puts his, name to his, puts his name to his brilliant, but you've I, there was something about it that I kind of went, the ridiculousness of the how magic it was, the random word felt a bit random to me. And what you've done, and I'm not just saying this to to flatter you at all. I think it's an important point of the book is that you've gone right that 
how can I make that more meaning? How can I adapt it? Because there will be people that will be fine with the original way it works because it suits them. Yeah. And you've gone through this process and you're sharing what, what you've done to it. And I think what you said there is key. You didn't just do it for creativity. You didn't just do it to go, I need to change it. Because as you say, you do the Daryl routine. You, know, you might be on yeah. script, but you've got, you've, you do that routine as is because it, you felt that it didn't need changing. And I always, there, there's an obsession with um, originality, which I do understand. But I remember being at the street performing in Covent Garden. And the, there were some shows that were incredibly origi original, really original, mm -hmm. but absolutely appalling. And I was in one of them. Me and my friend got together. We did a double act and we said, right, let's do this. It's really original. And, but the original stuff was terrible. <laughs> you know? yeah. So at some point you've got to kind of, you know, leave, leave that to the people that thrive off that stuff and love it. And, but, yeah. but as a performer, we do have to kind of get to a point of going, change it if it needs changing. But maybe if we've got something that we can, just put our personality into and that's enough yeah we all have different gifts and different strengths and different weaknesses you know so some people can be original and their original stuff is great and some people um excel at you know maybe routining tricks together into the form of a show and some people excel at doing comedy and i think when you're younger you also tend to think that everybody has the right idea, except yeah. for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Well, and, that, that so don't change. Easy. Yeah, it's easy to be influenced because you watch, um, just name any of the masters. You watch Darren Brown and you think, you know what? That's it. That gets inside people's minds. It makes them think there's something real going on that they don't understand and that they can't explain. And then you see David Williamson and you say, you know, People just want to laugh. Mm. They just want to have fun. That's the thing that matters because he's hilarious. And then you see, you know, someone else doing just close-up magic who's great with cards. And you think that's, that's what people like. They don't want all this talking. They want that visual eye candy thing. This is what the world wants. So it's easy to become influenced and to think each person has the right idea. So I think it's good to uh, realize what you're good at and not to say not to give up trying to do those other things too. But I think it's worth, um, you know, realizing what are you good at? What do you excel at? And bring that to the table because that's what you do. You know, that's, there's something profound in there for me. I think it's because I recognize that process and, and the process of, whatever you're seeing at that time being successful, hooking into that and thinking, maybe I should do that. I went through that and I had to I really struggle with that because every two minutes I was, I mean, I'm a little bit ADD anyway. So every two minutes I think I want to do that. Oh no, I want to do that. I want to. And at one point I was doing like a classic ball and cone routine. I was doing the kind of flourishy stuff. I was kind of like, and, and to be honest, I'm still a bit, I don't really know what, you know, <laughs> what I am and never will, but <laughs> just about human at the moment, I think. Um, <laughs> But there is there is a real difficulty with that. And I'm sure a lot of people aren't like it, but I can recognize that so much. Uh, I mean, it, it reminds me of a story when I was um, God would have been about 2002. I did stand up in London for a bit and I was trying and and I kind of knew I could perform because I was already working the street and I thought, OK, it'll be all right. And I was a huge fan of Bill Hicks, the comedian. And to me, he was the pinnacle. I saw him live. Um, you know, many years before that, and, and he was just, you know, there was nobody better. And I wrote, I did a, an open mic spot and, and uh, went, to, I was really nervous, did the open mic spot and did really well because I didn't do any material because something happened in the audience and because I used to work the street, I could improvise around it. And this woman came up and we had a great time. I thought, I'm great at this. And then I did it again and invited friends, which is a kiss of death. Mm -hmm. And um, and went, right, I'm going to do my material. And it, it was the biggest humiliation. I had all these friends going, oh. not one single tear. No, nothing. Oh. It was, and it was that thing where you have to walk back to the table of your friends afterwards. Oh. And they're going, what do we say? What do we say? He's literally done, you know, and it was like, well mm -hmm. done. You know, that's about all you can get. Mm. And, and it was because I'd written the material ha as Bill Hicks. I'd written it with his voice in my head, right? And it mm. wasn't that it wasn't, his, it wasn't his stuff, but it had that, same kind of semi kind of politicals and like this wasn't me you know I, I can't get away with the kind of 
that level of darkness. And it yeah. was a real lesson. And I still find myself every now and then, if I'm coming up with a routine, I have to kind of stop myself and go, is this your voice? Mm-hmm. And I still don't know what, um, you talk about flight time. And I think that's one of the ways of doing it. You know, one of the ways is just do it again and again. And you'll, you, you go through a process of kind of relaxing into your, who you are. Yeah. But, but I think, again, you mentioned talking to Paul Harris and Paul Harris talking to you about the palm. And would you have taken the palm out had he not said that? So is there mm-hmm. something about having people you're confident with, mentors that, that you mm-hmm. trust? I, I don't know whether you've got that. When you show people, do you work with directors? Have you got people that? Yeah, that I tend trust? to, I like to work in a bit of a vacuum. I mean, and then eventually I don't mind for people that I respect to see my show and to offer notes and thoughts on it. But I think if you bring someone in too early and different people have different approaches, my approach is to just kind of work on it by myself because I don't want somebody to talk me out of something, you know, and they can very easily do that. Say, yeah, but well, you know, you, this is my version of the invisible deck. Yeah, but it's the invisible deck. Why are you doing that? And then you start thinking, yeah, why am I doing it? But you might've had a great idea and you don't want to get discouraged too early on. So once it's out there and it's up and running, you can let someone see it and say, you know, I think this would be better if you did this and that, and you could either take their advice or you could think about why are you doing it that way? And um, I mean, you mentioned about Bill Hicks and the being influenced by him. If you want to do comedy right now, you're going to instantly think of your favorite comedians. And now you're going to compare yourself to the best in the world. And that's kind of a hard place to be in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> because they're the best. Because they've been doing it their whole lives. And they've reached a certain level that they, they should reach because of how good they are. And now you're starting out and you want to be that person. It's the same thing in magic, you know? And then you mentioned about having friends come to the, come to the show years ago. I used to not want anybody I know to ever no. be in the audience. Mm. People say, I no, want to I see a show. Can't. And I'd say, I don't want you to come. No. And they wouldn't understand why. Well, we're your friends. We want to see it. And you're right. If you have that type of show where afterwards you have to kind of you know, you're avoiding eye contact with people because you think if you can't see them, they can't see you. And it's a terrible feeling, Mm -hmm. but keep the faith because I think if people do feel that way early on, you will get to a point where you, you can invite people because you're so confident and there's just no faking it. You can practice a hundred times. You can do all the steps, but until you do the show thousands of times, you won't have that inner confidence, that genuine confidence. And I'm sure you've watched videos of yourself doing a show and you can't even watch the video without cringing. You're in your room by yourself watching your video and you're cringing at what you see. But then as the years go by, you know, not, the, not that you sit there and admire yourself, but you can kind of laugh at some of your moments and say, yeah, this kind of worked. Yeah. I like the way that went. So I think people just have to, like I said, keep the faith when it's at that early point to um to developing something yeah there, there's a massive thing about faith there i remember someone saying to me again about stand-up because there were people on the open mic circuit that were clearly not funny people mm. they, they they didn't have funny bones but because they just and they weren't ever going to be you know up there but they were getting away with it and they were doing sets and they were getting laughs and, and you would see it and go, they're not very good. But actually, you look at the audience and there's something working there. And someone said to me, that's just because they just didn't stop. And if you don't stop doing it, it is at some point going to work out Absolutely. in some way. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. And in magic, we have a similar thing with um, somebody who's great at marketing and somebody who's doing corporate shows and making great money. And you see his show and you're like, how is that possible? Because he's yeah. great at the other things that not all of us are great at. So, yeah. and the same way with, um, you know, developing an act, I think the same for what you're saying about eventually it's going to work out. If you put together a show with 10 tricks that have nothing to do with each other, and you just keep doing it. Eventually you're going to find segues and you're yeah. going to find yeah. ways of routining tricks together and changing the order almost without even trying, you know, trying, but not trying. And you just realize this trick would be better here. Oh, this trick I can do in the middle of the audience. This trick I can do in conjunction with that other trick and with that same spectator. So I don't have to call another person up on stage. It's kind of the same. Yeah. I love that. You've got that. 
<laughs> I was reading it last night again, and um, you've got that. When you're talking about, look, you know, you'll realise that sometimes it's okay to leave people in the audience. So if you're doing a book test, you haven't got to get them up on stage. And I had a moment in my one man show and it was kind of I'd rehearsed it a lot, but there was just stuff I couldn't rehearse in it. And I thought, well, I'm going to get three people up on stage. And of course, the reality was when I got them, there was not loads of room. And I already had someone sitting and I had three people standing and I was doing fourth dimensional telepathy. Um, and it was just a mess. I mean, there was somebody, it, uh, there was clearly no room. So I sent someone back. So there's one in the audience, two on stage, kind of standing in front of each other, blocking each other. Someone's sitting down. <laughs> and the whole, thing, oh, <laughs> the whole thing was just this massive shambles. And, and, and I think, but it was funny, the feedback from the show. You know, I had a few people that weren't actually magicians that I kind of went, right, I want feedback on what bits. And they were kind of taking a few notes. People that I trust, I had a theatrical director there. And actually, even though that was brought up, it, it, in the moment, it was so disastrous. But for the audience, it wasn't. Don't get me wrong. Right. It's not going to be like that next time. That's the learning for me, because they don't know how good it can be. And how. But I think that to go through that, and something can feel so messy to you, but that is part of the process. And we've got this lovely thing with magic. And even with all that mess, at the end, I got the three words. People had no <laughs> clue, and they were completely blown away. You know what I mean? So we've got 100%. that lovely... Yeah. Absolutely. And you know, the thing to remember is that somebody told me a long time ago, you're always doing better than you think you're doing. Yeah. Because we're aware you're talking about the staging and the confusion, and you're probably having hot flashes and you're doing this thing and you know, you're, you're hyper aware of it, but the audience isn't aware of it the way we are. And um, I mean, they see it, of course, they're, they're not oblivious to it, but they're not as critical of ourselves as we can be. I mean, that's, you mentioned fourth dimensional telepathy. I love that routine. I just love that whole routine, everything about it. I love right. the effect. I love the method. I love the fact that it uses office supplies, which I can stock up on. And then I love being able to get rid of them in the course of doing the trick. I love everything about fourth dimensional telepathy. Um, but it did take a long time to figure out the staging, Yeah, you know, where do people stand? Even something that should be obvious that when the person comes, they're going to stand to my right because I'm going to turn toward them and do that billet switch inside my pocket. And I didn't realize that that would even be a problem until I tried it the other way. I said, let's see what it's like when I have the person on my left. There might be a reason for that that I'm not aware of. So I'm going to try it once. And that's when I realized I'm doing that billet switch inside the pocket. It's better if they don't see that pocket, obviously. Sure. But, you know, you just learn by doing it. And that is, you're right. You can do that trick and it can be going badly as far as the staging goes, but the effect is still there. Yeah. And so that's, that is what saves us. You're right. I, lo I love the, it always makes me think that routine. A couple of things, actually. Someone, um, and if you don't know what, if you're watching this, uh, Bob, what, it's Animans originally, isn't it? But Bob Cassidy yes. kind of. Yeah. Um, did a whole thing on it and that's where i learned it and it's um it's basically a free envelope you know prediction not prediction um well it depends how you want to sell it i suppose but people write down either someone they went to school with a place or they draw a picture and then you you get the um duplication of all of them um it someone said to me once it's like the cups and balls you 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 will learn it and you can do it and the more you do it the more you find those little ways of timings and and I like that idea of taking even a card trick, what could be a basic card trick, and not just learning it so you can do it and that being it, but but giving it that flight time and letting it evolve into something that becomes you. It's like when I do the cups and balls, it's a classic. It's not my routine, but it feels like my rhythms. Even, you know, some people right. down might, might disagree because I basically copied him for about 10 years. Um, but I think it's that's interesting. And also it reminds me about that there's a kind of ceiling level of, of effectiveness with magic so you take something like that that uses a couple of envelopes um bit of glue and some paper and i you do that and, and i i do that routine i think it, it can't really get stronger you, you know that they're, they're enjoying it they don't know how it's done and then you've got you know you can spend three four grand on on stuff and yeah. i don't get me wrong i, I want that stuff because it's exciting yeah. <laughs> it lets me do <laughs> cool stuff but i do wonder sometimes but why am I getting it? Because that's the kind of ceiling. It's like having a house in a road and you keep spending money on the house and you know it's only going to sell for a certain amount, right? So you Absolutely. could do whatever you want to it. 
Yeah. And I, I, want, I wonder if we are sometimes, well, one is, or the community is, it's easy to get lost in the kind of this thing does that thing and forget kind of what, what that process is like for the audience and what they're seeing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree. I remember um, years ago, I bought the Kyber Cobra. Remember from Collector's Workshop, which okay. was the snake basket where. Oh, yeah. The yeah, I saw that. yeah and the yeah. snake rises up out of the basket with the card in his mouth. And now I do magic professionally, but the guilt that I had <laughs> over spending $1,500 on a card trick, I cannot tell you the anxiety and the guilt and the fact that I felt like this is not <laughs> right. And I did it one time and I had to get rid of it. I had to sell it, Be not because of the guilt, but because of the fact that I'm thinking this is a $1,500 card trick and I could do a different card trick. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that last five minutes. $2. Now, if it was great, I wouldn't mind. I think I wouldn't mind now, but I really did have a problem with it back then. I really felt guilty about it. Yeah. I mean, and that's, as I said, even doing magic professionally, and this is for your business and going to create and generate more work for you. But it was kind of tough at the time, but you're right. I mean, here you have the Bob Cassidy routine that we're talking about with just simple envelopes and glue and paper. And the impact is as strong as can be, but I think yeah. it's okay to do both. You know, if I felt like there was a routine out there, I mean, there's a lot of electronic things now that are, you know, that kind of money. And if they're great, it's worth it. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I'm, 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 I think it's more about, because I've got myself caught up in that thing but you know, years ago of kind of going, oh, I really want that thing and nearly buying, you know, the Labco product. And, and don't you, it's stunning stuff. You see people yeah. going jolly doing stuff and, it, you, you know, you know it works, you know it's brilliant. But stopping for a second and going, where's it going to fit? And waiting until you know you want that, you know, for someone that, that reviews stuff, I get sent a lot of stuff and I, I thought mm -hmm. I'd be doing this and I'd have all this new stuff for my show because I'm reviewing it all. It's like, it doesn't mean yeah. it's bad. It just, there's not a context I can see with it. it that, that and you have to me. learn it and bring it up to performance speed anyway. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing that with everything coming out in magic that you really do, even now, somewhere in the back of your mind, you think if you buy that download, you have that trick now. You don't have it you have the information and you have the video of it, but you did not put the work into learning that routine and bringing it up to performance level to be able to do it for an audience. And, and you, and I'm going to go back to the book because I'm going to keep going back to the book. And, and um, that process, uh, what I will say that all of it, pretty much everything here doesn't require any kind of, it's pretty much all stuff you can, do with the odds i mean you have to you know with a ring flight you want a ring flight sure. you know and you, sure. you talk about the different ones but it's not gonna you know in the wallet and but it's it's all stuff that i would say you can most people are going to be able to do without breaking a bank yeah and and you talk through that process of it inspires books like this inspire that process they inspire that process and me of going stick with this thing that i've got and really work it and and I've, sometimes when i when i talked about mentors earlier i I, I find it hard to find mentors. I have, I'm, I'm working with Steve Reynolds at the moment on some card stuff, but with performance, I find it hard sometimes. Because, like you said, I'm a little in a bit of a vacuum. And I think books like this can give you that kind of mentorship. Um, and the, it's interesting, and I really want to sort of hit this because I, I get people contacting me quite a lot saying, I've been, I got this that you said was good on the review show and I've, I've been working with it. I can't get this to work. Why can't I get this to work? And you realise they've been playing with it for like a day. Yeah. You know? And I would say, it, even with stuff like your know, wiki test, you know, which I do, do you know wiki test? Or, or just, love yeah, it. of course you do. Yeah. yeah. Um, so if you don't know and you're watching, wiki test is a, one of the best magic apps there is. Um, I performed it on stage. I, the day I'd done it before Christmas, uh, no, before the first lockdown lifted. I was doing Zoom shows for the first time, and that was my closer. Mm. I got that thing wrong. It was before last Christmas. That's what I said before, I think. I got that thing wrong like four times in a row. I got the wow. thing. And it, and it was because, it wasn't because I was doing the trick wrong. It's because of the little bits of scripting I wasn't saying quite right, so the person on Zoom wouldn't understand the thing. And I realized that you, you, you've got an app, and with apps, there's that feeling of, oh, I've got the app now. 
But I had to go through that same process. And it was actually longer than quite a lot of sleight of hand processes going, right, actually, if I say that there, that's not going to be ambiguous. And they're going to make sure. And even the, the week before I did my one man show and I was ending with a version of Wiki, uh, Wiki test, um, I got it wrong in front of mm. <laughs> the last word, just didn't get it. <laughs> wow. That's the very last yeah, thing. Great. And that was oh, a yeah. that was kind of mixing it with the stranger, which was even worse because there's this whole process of phoning up a stranger <laughs> and they're going to get the word and they just say a different word and it's like great. Oh man! So the lesson, what did you yeah. do? What did you, so at the end of the show, what was your? Uh... Have a nice time. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's an ambitious card routine. Color card, get it. Yes, <laughs> exactly. I'll do something I know will work. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was lucky because it was with an audience in a little mini festival, and they knew I was trying stuff out, so okay. it was fine. So the lessons there were that I think that never sit on your laurels and kind of go, "I've got it now. I've done it five times." It always go back to it and always refresh those little subtleties because I know what I did wrong. I just wasn't concentrating because i was doing two things i wasn't concentrating on the one thing and i basically just forgot the word and just just you yeah. know thought it was another one forgot the first letter absolutely um, it's, it happens yeah i've you know i don't want to get you off track but that happened no. during uh fourth dimensional telepathy a couple of times when you look at that name when you're one ahead <laughs> now and then you just forget the name now you have the person up there <laughs> but that's even more of a problem because it's now perfect. you have to go back to it yeah yeah with the second piece of snuffle paper. around. So your uh, person is uh, what did you write there? What was it? Yep. <laughs> so it's twice that it happens in that routine. Oh, yeah. oh man. So you have to remember. It sounds like a weird thing. You know why would that be hard to remember the name? Because you're performing. You're in front of the audience, and you can yeah. easily forget these things. I, I've done it. I've done it. Loads mm -hmm. of center tear. Bang. Looked at yeah. it, forgot it. <laughs> Look at it, saw it, read it, forgot it. Put it, put it <laughs> you might as well just tear it up for real. And yeah. Just, you know, get rid of it. I know. Yeah. And it's hard to, um, but I think with mentalism, there's a little bit of an out with that because it's kind of like, oh, he was, I guess he wasn't able to tune in. And then you always try to, uh, you know, make it feel like you were closer. Like, oh, you thought of the name Harry? Well, I got Robert. That's close. That's close. And you, no, it's not close, <laughs> but you just try to, play it off and go on to the next thing oh yeah. man and i think That's there's also uh, there's also a weekend so, and don't, i'm really bad at this as well if i've learned a new trick i'm like it's got to be perfect and if i get it wrong it's like the worst thing if i get it wrong it's the worst thing and i'm going to be the you know the humiliation of the whole town and and the village and if you're <laughs> kind of you know if you kind of go oh that didn't work did it people kind of laugh and go all right fair enough you know it's that thing right. of we get so caught up you know we I, and yeah. I don't, be, don't I have a huge love and respect for magic I absolutely adore it and I, it's the same when I was a street performer it's the same when I did stand up and it's like we're just performers you know nobody dies it, it's it's yes. it's you know we want to do an amazing job and you talk you, you, in your intro to the book you talk about actually it, it, your intro is a reminder of how special a magic show is you know it's that thing of yes it used to be this big grand thing but even there's a there's a a magic, not in our context, but a, a different kind of magic to a show. That is, a, it's a big thing, you know. We, you're, people are sitting down Absolutely. and they're going to see, see these miracles. Yes, and it, there's something very majestic about even when you walk into maybe a hotel bar uh, ballroom or even somebody's living room. You kind of set up all of your equipment. You told them how to set up the room. Everybody's around, and it's just the way you want. And now you're putting on a magic show. I think that is such a grand thing. You're yeah. not just the guy up there with your case doing some tricks and making people laugh. You are putting on a magic show. I mean, I think that is a grand thing. Um, and it doesn't just have to be like it was in the old days when it really, when we look back on it, it feels like a grand thing. And even though you're doing maybe a one person show, but it is special. And I think it is. Um, you know, should be treated as special as it is. I mean, we've all dealt, I was going to write a thing in the book um, towards the end, talking about the death of the live show, which is something I really notice more and more that people just don't put the care into having your show that you put into doing your show. So you mm -hmm. might get there and there's the, you told them to have the tables close, but the tables are all 30 feet away before the first row of tables. And you told them they have to be closer. And they say, well, 
Usually they just keep it like that. Well, it would be better though if we can move the tables closer. Well, there's no one to move them. Well, I'll move them. Is it okay if I do it? Well, it's usually, just, and all these little things. I went to a place to do a show the other night. It was gonna be dinner and a show. And the person at the front desk told me that the dinner was canceled, but they're still doing the show. And I said, okay. I said, I hope, you know, we get some people. And he said, did you have a lot of signups? And I'm saying, clearly you're confusing me for someone who works here. I don't know <laughs> what you're talking about signups. Like this is your thing to do. <laughs> you know? so, no. but, and I just wish that, um, I wish that people had the same reverence. Most people do. If you're doing corporate things and you're getting paid a good amount of money, yeah. people trust you. They say, you're the professional. You've done this a million times. You said we should close the bar. So we're going to close the bar. You said we shouldn't serve food during your show. So we're not going to serve food during your show. Most of the time they do that, but there are all these little things that happen along the way. You told them to have a sound system and they don't have the right kind of sound system. Hmm. You told them you need a stool they don't have a stool, like little things like that. But obviously I didn't write about that in the book because I think it has kind of a negative feel to it. So I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to end the book on a negative note, but that is a real thing, you know? It is. And I think you do kind of, in a way you cover it in a, a roundabout way, because even in the intro, again, like I said, it, I don't sound like I've just read the intro ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're still on the intro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, one, wow. yeah. and the other thing you said in the intro <laughs> that I read today. In the table of contents, I noticed you had a, quite a few things yeah. listed. Let's yeah, start. let's talk about the first trick and <laughs> and the intro. Because I'm, I'm yeah, yeah, still there. Stuff in, the, in the rest of it. Look, I'll have you know, I've got I've got things there. Oh, they do nice. only go halfway. They go three quarters of the way, because I haven't read the last um, quarter of the book, um, I will admit. But I've reread the first three quarters twice. And that's what I've done. I'm honored. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty honored. sure it's not going to, I've, I've scanned it and I know you go into the details. You go into almost go into more of those details. So even though you're not saying this is the bad stuff that can happen, you are talking about the things that you must put into place to avoid those things happening without explicitly yes. mentioning them. So again, from the intro. Before the yeah. show. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And making sure that you're directive about that. And, and you know, you create you paint this picture of you go to the show and you make sure this is happening you make sure that's right and you ensure and i think that if we're not careful especially when we're starting out we we're so worried about people feeling ill of us we're a bit nervous anyway we want them to like us mm -hmm. no we don't want to be prima donnas but we need to kind of make sure that we are creating the conditions that are that are more favorable to, to them having a great time in the end right yes that's what it, you're not being like you said you're not being a prima donna you're not being a diva all you're trying to do is the best show possible for their guests. So yep. um, that's why I didn't want to talk in the book and like I was talking down to people saying people can be set up in a room in different ways. But I kind of, like you said, mentioned it throughout the book. So maybe in this yep. situation, you're doing a show for 30 people and they're all around a table. But now let's imagine a bigger scenario. Now you have about 50 people and they're in rows of chairs. Now you have 60 or 70 people, but they're at tables. And because when you're younger, you might say to somebody, how many people are going to be at the show? And they'll say 100. And you say, okay, 100 people. But there's a difference between 100 people that are set up in rows of chairs, theater style, yeah. and 100 people that are at tables, banquet style. In that case, the yeah. room is much bigger. The sight lines are not as good. So those things matter. So I think, you know, you're right. Let's find out about them before the show starts before you even get there. And then the other advantage is that now you're getting to a place where you've never been, you don't know anyone who works there, and you have somebody saying, hi, Steve, we have the room set up for you. And you've never met that person. And he's calling you by your first name. And he's setting up the room the way you want. That's a great feeling. Yeah, it, it is. Mm -hmm. and, and I find you get them more, actually. The, when you, the difficulty yeah. is when you start out and you're doing maybe some free stuff because you're getting a feel for it. You don't get that respect. It's kind of like when right. you're, or really when you're trying to be the person who's easy to get along with. Oh, it's okay. Yeah, sure. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. It's yeah. fine. No, there is a level of that. You know, sometimes something can't be changed, and you just kind of have to roll with it. And yeah. you know, I mean, I was doing a show once, and the person was keeping an eye on the volume of the music, but the music kept turning down. Like the music would start, and then he would turn it down. So during the show, I have to say, okay. Let's bring the music back up. 
Yeah. And then I would do the next thing and the music came in and then he turned the volume down again. And this is during the show now. So I say, okay, bring the music up. He brings it up and then he turns it down again. So finally I say, bring the music up and leave it up. And you don't want to create this, you know, weirdness during the show that kind of breaks the yeah, yeah. feeling of a show. Now, after the show, is it worth me going to that guy and saying, we went over this? I told you no, because it's done. Yeah. What are you going to do now? You can't go back and change anything. No. So you make the best of it in the moment. I think that's a great point. It's that idea of co consequence. You know, you can you can kick up a fuss, but if you're not going to be performing there again, yes, if you're doing yeah. this, if you're doing a ten night run, it's a different thing. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, and it's it's working with what you got, which again, I, I want to sort of um, just tell people a little bit about. I, I will do a full review of the book. Um, but I think, it, it, you know, it's full of these, you, you mentioned it then, this idea of you starting at the beginning with, with Name Dropper, you talk about that you've got these people here and then you, Magician versus Gambler and the Lazy Man's Card trick, all these tricks that actually, if you wanted to learn them from this book, you could go and do them close up. But, and even Chris Kenner's Sybil the trick, you know, you got um, an idea of Sybil, and, you know, the, the, which we all now call the flourish, but it's based on this, yeah. this trick. And then you've got a stage version of it I just wouldn't have thought of it, it. Like I said at the beginning, it gives you that freedom of kind of looking at this stuff and go, actually, let's not write that off. It could work on stage. Um, yes. And I want people to know that there's great tricks to learn in here. Even if you've never done part of it, you can take out the close up, and also that you can then, if you're in a room with 20, 30 people, you don't have to go, well, I've got to learn a whole new kind of parlor set. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And I love it, John. I think it's such a, Thank it's you. It's such a lovely book. And it's um it's so well written. I can't imagine how long it took to because it because it, it is well written. There's there doesn't there's no fluff in it. Um, you know, I'll just mention quickly as as he wind does the these kind of what do you call them? You've got a name for these. Uh panel art. Yeah, before panel each. Art. Yeah. Yeah. Which I love too. I wanted that to look like the um the old school magic catalogs. Yeah. Because we've all seen them and those pictures inspired us to want to learn the tricks. Like you would see those tricks in the catalog and say, I want to do that trick. And so that's what I'm hoping with the book. People kind of see that, feel that way. And now they don't have to, like in the old days, mail, mail and send away for it. You can learn the trick right then and there. So that's why I'm hoping yeah. it just inspires the reader. Because I love what he did with those pictures. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. It's, um, so is there anything else you want to, you, you want to uh, communicate before we tie up? John or I didn't happy? think of anything in particular I'm glad to talk to you though you know cool. and uh, if this doesn't record we'll do it all over again oh, don't, don't. And, I'm, I'm gonna find out in like two minutes I'm gonna press about it says recording it's almost like it, a one it still says recording yeah <laughs> so, so if it doesn't you, you you will just you know I'll owe you one I'll just no, you I'm know. glad to talk to you um, I enjoy what you do on your YouTube channel and um you have a great conversational way about you and i really like what you're doing so i'm just glad to be a part of it and to get to know you so i thank yeah. you for being interested in the book yeah great and um and you certainly got to know me because we've talked for hours now <laughs> that's right and we'll do it again <laughs> and we'll do it again when, uh, when i send you the when i send you the uh, message of shame later <laughs> uh, so um okay well i'm going to say goodbye to you now don't go anywhere. We'll say goodbye for the video. Um, but thanks for watching, everybody. I will top and tail this. But uh, stage by stage, the links will be below um, from John Graham. It's just a, a wonderful book. Again, full review will be up soon. Uh, but thank you so much, John. Take care. Thank you, Steve. So there you go. I'm not going to bang on. That was brilliant. Please comment below and I will take your questions into the uh, sessions on Thursday evenings, most Thursdays at 5 UK time. I'll be reading your comments and answering a lot of them. So do that. Um, please use the links below. If you haven't got the book, get it. It's great. I'm not an affiliate. I get nothing from this. I just think good books need to be shared. And this is certainly one of them. John, thank you so much, so much for, for being a wonderful guest, sharing candidly your, your ideas and also uh, for coming back again after I completely nosed up the first one. So have a good one, everybody. Like, subscribe. Check out cardmagiccourse.com. Use the links below. Take care. Bye.